Hey everybody, thanks for taking the time to listen to the Real Talk podcast. We hope that these discussions will inform and inspire you to engage in your own Real Talk. Today's episode is brought to you by our official sponsor, TriVan, builders of custom trucks, trailers, and enclosure buildings tailored to your needs. Be sure to check them out at www.trivan.com. A big thanks to them for making these conversations possible. Now, on to the episode. Hey everybody, welcome to the Real Talk Podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by uh, a party leader in Ontario's election right now. I know this is uh, another political episode, but uh, tis the season here in Ontario. And uh, when uh, we have Mr. Derek Sloan with us today from the Ontario Party, uh, he'd uh, asked to come on and, and chat with us and and you guys, obviously, through us and to see, um, just to let you all know what he's doing, what he's what he's running for, what the Ontario Party is all about. So uh, I guess, yeah, with that in mind, we're hoping to have a great conversation with him. And uh, I guess I'll throw it over to Darren, uh, Derek first, rather. Uh, so just give people a bit of a background. Who are you? Uh, why are you interested in politics and, and why are you running? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I've been in politics for about uh, four years officially and, and a few more years than that unofficially. Um, I used to be a federal member of parliament. I was uh, a member of the Conservative Party. I ran for leadership of the Conservative Party and I was ultimately ejected from the Conservative Party for being, uh, you know, too frank and open on uh, COVID issues, you know, social conservative issues, other issues like that. Um, so I... Uh, it became clear to me that the mainstream parties are not, um, you know, they're 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 not where they need to be to to be able to run this country properly. So I started thinking about other ways to get involved in politics. I was asked to the Ontario Party, which is a party that's been around uh, for for a little while, but you know doesn't really have the name brand recognition of of the big parties. So um, uh, during that time. Uh, I thought it would be, you know, helpful to try and uh, uh, fight at the provincial level. There's obviously, we need to reform government at all levels, municipal, provincially, and federally. But I thought that it would be, uh, you know, a good time for me to get involved here in Ontario. I live in Ontario. And uh, so I did that. The Ontario Party, of course, has, um, uh, you know, grown very rapidly uh, in only a few months. And we have, uh, you know, right, right now about 100 candidates. We'll, we'll maybe have a few more before Election Day. Uh, but, you know, nearly a full slate of candidates to uh, fight in this upcoming election. So um, that's, uh, that's a little background to me. I'm, uh, you know, married, uh, three kids, and, uh, you know, a Christian, and uh, very uh, concerned about the state of the country. Um, and uh, frankly, I uh, feel called to, to be in politics. And uh, if I didn't feel called, I wouldn't be here. So that's, uh, that's what I'm doing. And I want to fight on every level that I can to uh, you know, make, make our country a free country again, to uh, make our country you know, a country that respects its roots, respects uh, you know, uh, values, and, and uh, you know, respects the, the rule of law and the supremacy of God. For sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. Um... You briefly ran out in um, in Alberta, I guess, in uh, after getting booted from the, the PCs, right? Um, federally, um, yeah, yeah, why did you choose to run out in Alberta in in the riding there, Banff, Airdrie, I think it was. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so so um, at the time we we didn't know uh, we didn't know when the election was going to be, or even if there was going to be a federal election. And I was touring around the country. Um, you know, spreading awareness on freedom issues in, in regards to, you know, lockdowns and, and mandates and things like this. And um, so being that, you know, my entire team was out in Alberta and we had like an entire tour plan, we had kind of, we had to make a decision quickly. There was, of course, rumors that the election was going to be called, but in politics, there's always rumors. There was, there was rumors from the day I got elected for the next couple of years, there was a rumor that, you know, an election was just around the corner. So, um, when the election was called and we were in the middle of touring out there, we said, you know what, as an independent, I can run anywhere. I have a, you know, a big following out in Alberta. Why not, uh, you know, run out here um, and sort of utilize some of the, you know, the following that I had. Um, obviously, Alberta is a place that, you know, resonates with the freedom message. Um, a lot of, pro a lot of, there's a lot of people in every province that do, but there is a very strong contingent of freedom loving people in the West. And we thought we would, you know, kind of take on a big wig conservative in their in their own, uh, you know, stomping grounds. And unfortunately, we weren't successful. Um, but again, it's very challenging as an independent to to, you know, make inroads. 
uh, uh, which is, you know, again, why um, we're using a party vehicle to do that. I think in a perfect world, independents would be a great would be great representatives. But we live in a system that's dominated by party politics. And so that's uh, the route we've we've gone this time. All right. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good segue, though, into uh, into the Ontario Party and, and what you're doing now here in Ontario. So I, I actually, yeah, that was one of my main questions I wanted to ask you. Um, so I, I can see this certainly there's a, a fair amount of discontent. Um, we've heard that from our listeners as well with the PC party and, and, and Doug Ford and whatnot. Um, we recently had a couple MPPs on to defend the record and I think we had a great exchange and, and they certainly had some points to, uh, to make in that regard. But also um, there's definitely an appetite for, for some change there too. What made you, um, uh, what made you really think that you needed to sign on with the Ontario party and try to revitalize uh, that party and, and make it, uh, yeah, make it a force to be reckoned with, make it, uh, make it a name in Ontario households rather than trying to make some change from within inside the party vehicle of the Ontario PCs? Well, I mean, in all, in all fairness, I tried to work with the federal conservatives as long as I could. I was ejected from the party. I had my membership uh, stripped from me uh, by the national council. The Ontario PCs are actually kind of more, um, you know, controlled by a, you know, a tight inner circle of people than the federal party is. So um, I am, I am almost positive that had I, uh, you know, sought the nomination for any riding here that I would have been uh, denied uh, uh, prima facie uh, that opportunity. But, you know, beyond that, um, I didn't want to be, I mean, you know, I, uh, most MPs are just placeholders. They do whatever they're told. They, do, you know, they vote along party lines because they have to. And the Ontario PC party has a track record of kicking people out that don't toe the party line. They've, they've ejected, I think about seven uh, member, uh, provincial members of parliament for different reasons, but they all uh, relate to not doing what the party leader wants them to do. So that's not an environment that I you know, wanna be involved in. And frankly, I don't think they would have welcomed me in, in any event. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of concerns about, um, you know, basically the Ontario PCs not following, demo, following democratic principles. There's concerns about, you know, uh, rigging nominations, uh, messing around at policy conventions, things like this. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time fighting within uh, conservative party circles, but frankly, I don't have time for that anymore. If they want to play those kinds of games, they're welcome to do it. But um, I'd rather start afresh, and I think we'll have more success in the long run doing it that way. Yeah, as as a Christian too. So, I guess well, you yeah, you're mentioning some of these. It's it's yeah, a bit of a struggle. Like, do you do you try for change from the inside, or do we? Um, and I guess some of the grassroots uh, kind of movements are kind of feeling the same thing. Um, as a Christian, um, where is that line? Like we, we often talk, we've talked in this podcast too about um, do we support, you know, everything uh, or a candidate on principles and what principles uh, are we willing to, you know, kind of move on in order to, you know, see some change in our province or in our country. Um, like as a Christian, was that, was that decision, you know, different for you or or did that play into it at all well i mean the decision was kind of made for me um when i uh you know when i uh, didn't win the leadership race i knew that there might be some tension in the ranks but i you know i said to myself listen um i'm not going to you know try to get into trouble or try to get kicked out i'm just going to you know kind of do what i've always done and you know i was ejected in a kind of spectacular and almost miraculous manner um you know entirely <laughs> out of my hands and, uh, you know, I was frankly, I was expecting God to do something and he showed up and, and, and that's what happened. Um, you know, and so, the, you know, my path was very clear in, in the sense of, of, of needing to be outside of the system. Now, that doesn't mean that that's everybody's path. But I, my own advice to people is that, um, you know, the, the, especially the Christians, is that the conservative parties in this country have spent many decades enjoying the donations and the volunteer time of Christians, but not, you know, not lifting uh, uh, an, 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 you know, a pound of their burden off their back in the sense of, I mean, you know, someone can point out to me any of the major things they've done for Christians, but it hasn't been much. So in my view, it's time to move on and do new things, but that doesn't mean that's, that's everybody's calling. So, uh, but I know very well where, what I'm called to do and, and that's to be outside of the system. Mm -hmm. 
So how long term of uh, of a movement is this? Like how how committed are you to the Ontario party? Because obviously, I mean, it's no, no surprise to anybody. It's incredibly challenging to win even a seat as a new upstart party. It's quite the endeavor. Um, and yeah, to form government is just, uh, I mean, it would be a pure miracle, honestly, if that were to happen. Um, are you looking to target certain ridings? Uh, what's what's the Ontario Party strategy, or, or is it just to kind of feel this large uh, a field of candidates as possible and gain momentum? Like, what are you guys looking to actually get out of an election like this? Yeah, I mean, we're we're obviously aiming to win. Um, if you know, to to form government, first crack at the you know first crack at the polls would obviously be very unlikely. Um, but having said that, there's a lot of Ontarians who are frustrated with the status quo. There's a lot of people who don't like anybody. Um, you know, we have, a we, you, you know, 50% is, is the rough voting turnout. It's a little bit higher than that, but we don't have the kind of voter turnout we had, uh, you know, when our parents were growing up, there was, uh, you know, high seventies, 80%, uh, uh, in terms of voter turnout. So there's a lot of people who are disenfranchised. I believe that the, uh, you know, the, a new, new political movements built correctly, uh, can prosper. Of course, we have to be able, be willing to build them. We you know we can't expect to win the first time around, and if we don't go home and cry about it, we have to build, and that's what we're planning to do. Um, I don't. None of the parties that I'm involved with are you know the party of Derek. They I, I you know I I only want to build parties that will outlast whoever happens to be leading them at the you know at the time. So the Ontario Party, I can't guarantee how long I will be leading the Ontario Party. But I am trying to build a party that will that will last for a long time and can, you know, make the change that we're trying to see. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, sorry, cut you off if you had a question, but so with the Ontario Party, um, that branding is is definitely more conducive to seeking a uh, you would get a larger segment of the population on board with that as opposed to just like conservative party or whatever. Obviously, in Saskatchewan, the government is the Saskatchewan party. Are you guys looking to, um, yeah, to try to to bring as many people in as possible or are you more taking the tack of like we are conservative we don't apologize and uh and this is who we are and hopefully you get enough yeah you know what like i so i think that marketing uh, approach would be a, a failing one um it's very clear to anybody who's who's you know really involved in um in politics that that we um we, we certainly satisfy the needs of ardent conservatives, not, you know, nine times out of 10. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, we're, we're looking to reach, we're, we're looking to govern the province. We're looking to govern Ontarians. And, um, I, you know, I think, you know, sometimes I, a lot of these, all of these ideologies have failed us. Um, you know, I call myself a conservative for, con, you know, um, as in people, you know, would also call me conservative. I'm certainly a right leaning politician as far as that goes, but in all honesty, these ideologies are, are, have failed us all, and we need to make sure that we're putting not, you know, some kind of ideology first, but the citizens of Ontario first. We need to have uh, people with sound judgment, moral judgment, and those that are putting the province first. And, you know, the, the policies that flow from that, whatever you want to call them, I don't care what you call them, but th those are the policies that are going to be what's right for the province. Mm -hmm. So how does... Um... How does the Ontario Party differ from some of the other right-wing parties that we've seen pop up in the last, uh, I guess, months before the election? And I mean, honestly, I don't know if anyone is going to see um, a lot of them on the ballot. Like, you have a lot of candidates running, but um, like, say, the uh, the new blue party is one that comes to mind that's been uh, marketing fairly well to my mailbox. So, um, yeah, what where do you differ on on policy and 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 your strategy, your approach? Yeah, well, um, I mean, you're right. There are a lot of different groups that are out there, and uh, I probably don't even know all of them. I, I do know that we've reached out to as many groups, uh, you know, that are in our knowledge base, and we've been able to bring various groups on side. So um, the, Rick Nichols, for example, wasn't going to run again. Now he's running again. Randy Hillier was going to start a party, but now he's not going to do that. Uh, there was a lot of division, and, and uh, you know, initially in this sphere. And I think that, you know, our, my primary motive of getting involved was to kind of bring some unity to this. And I think that I can confidently say that we've left it better than the way we found it. Um, you know, being 100% united on the right is, is, is not possible, unfortunately, but we've done our best. We've, we've made some uh, arrangements with some other parties as well that, that we'll be making some announcements on. Um, 
What I can say for people who are maybe wondering what to, and, and on the point of the party that you mentioned, we in fact did reach out to them and, and give a proposal, uh, but they, they rejected that. And, and people, uh, we published those things publicly so people can you know, look at our social media, see what we had proposed. Um, we're about building this province and about moving forward and getting things done. Um, some of the other parties out there are more about you know, slinging mud and, and you know, attacking people's characters. We've seen enough destruction in the past two years uh, to, to cover us a lifetime. We don't need any more of that. You're not going to see any attacks, uh, you know, uh, or at least character attacks coming from our party. We're here to provide a positive alternative and build the province. Um, and we're focused on, I think, the issues that matter. And that would be, for example, uh, the World Economic Forum and the Digital ID, which is, you know, a, a infrastructure of surveillance and, and tyranny, um, uh, medical freedom and choice. And then as well, uh, you know, banning foreign uh, purchasing of real estate and farmland. So we're really hitting, uh, you know, the, the points, I think a little bit differently than some of these other parties are. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a question of leadership. It's a question of um, approach and uh, voters will have their choice of how to respond to that. Okay. Yeah. So um, I guess, what are some of the major policy planks that um, you guys have in, uh, in your campaign? And what kind of sets you apart from uh, from other conservative parties? I, I guess particularly the uh, the reigning PCs right now. Yeah, so uh, so we have a, a very um, sort of streamlined platform that I think provides real ideas to make the province different. So if people go to our website, they can see what we stand for. But we have policies that would revitalize education, healthcare, uh, and the economy from the perspective of freedom. I think we're miles ahead of where the PCs are. So we're, uh, you know, against, um, you know, medical segregation. We're we're a hundred percent in favor of, of, you know, freedom of choice when it comes to health decisions, uh, medical privacy when it comes to. We don't feel you should have to share your, you know, your 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 medical information with, you know, the waiter at uh, at uh, Montana's or you know whatever it is. Um, we're against people's jobs being, you know, impacted by their personal medical decisions. And we're very strong on, uh, free speech. So whether that's social media censorship, uh, by the way, I got banned on Twitter. I think it was yesterday, uh, for the final, I think the final, final time. Um, so we're, you know, very against the censorship, whether it be, you know, social media or in schools. So we have a plan to kind of, you know, just really root that out because it, remember education is a provincial responsibility and uh, there's so much censorship going on in our, in our education right now. Yeah. yeah. There's, I mean, so maybe to some of those hot button issues, like you put forward a petition, I guess, against the digital ID not too long ago, right? That's um, correct. Yep. <clears throat> with um, Rick Nichols, I guess, in parliament. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Just, um, maybe explain like the issue, I guess, in general and what the uh, Ontario PCs were, were attempting to do or, or were supporting. Yeah. So the, the Ontario government had uh, said that they were going to bring in a digital ID this coming fall. And um, our party is, is, is strictly against that. The digital ID is a concept that is, you know, really promoted by, by the world economic forum and some of these other groups. And uh, they just, they just actually initiated one in France but the idea, again, is, you know, to get all your information kind of in one spot online uh, for the government. And um, we believe that's uh, infrastructure for tyranny. So if you look at what's going on in China right now, they have a social credit system where if you do the wrong things, say the wrong things online, you start to lose points. And once your you know, score gets to a certain level, you know, you can't buy plane tickets. You can't get into certain schools. You know, you're and I presume if it falls really low, you're going to get, a you know, uh, a visit in the middle of the night by, uh, you know, some people. So, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that we don't want to happen here in Ontario. We've already seen, uh, we've already seen the government, uh, you know, act in a ham fisted way towards protesters, you know, shutting down their bank accounts and stuff like this. If we ever get to the point where, um, you know, all of our information is kind of in one area online, um, they can just flip the switch for people that they deem to be, you know, a threat. And, um, and that's not to even mention the security risks that that type of thing poses. I mean, you know, right now somebody can hack it, you know, they can, they can steal your identity sometimes with just your address and a credit card number. So imagine if like, you know, all your information was accessible in an online format, 
Um, that's just asking for abuse. So there's a lot of different reasons why we're against it, but primarily because it gives the government potential power uh, to really control citizens. Um, you know, your imagination is, is, is the limit when it comes to what they could do. Imagine a lockdown that they did again, and they already, the Public Health Agency of Canada admitted to monitoring our, our location on our phones, not individually, but they were just monitoring you know, the group, they said they monitored 30 million cell phones or something like that. And, and, they, and that's why they came out and said, Hey, we know you guys aren't staying home, please stay home. So imagine if this was 10 years from now. And they said, if you travel 10 kilometers or more from your home, your credit cards aren't going to work. This is the infrastructure that would allow that to happen. So that's why we're against it. And I believe a lot of Ontarians are too. We got 26,000 signatures on that petition for a political petition in a single province. Uh, you know, over a couple of weeks, that's a lot of signatures. And uh, already the PC government is uh, declining to respond to, you know, uh, uh, when they're actually going to do this. So they've already stepped back on this. And we hope that they'll, they'll can the idea altogether. No, that's, that's great to hear. Yeah, I share your concerns on the on the centralization. But I guess if I were to steel man the case for, um, you know, a digital identification, like obviously the world is increasingly digital, these things are going online. Um, I don't know if that's something that you can you can stop necessarily, but you can certainly stop the centralization of the data in one place, which uh, would prevent uh, future tyranny, uh, regardless of who who's in power. Really, um, have you guys uh, talked with anybody in the cryptocurrency space related to decentralizing uh, this data and um, some of the process processes and uh, stipulations they have for keeping this data separate? Is that a policy plank you guys have considered at all? Yeah. So in terms of in terms of decentralization, I think that's key. I mean, you know, all of our data uh, that relates to us is is largely available somewhere online, right? I mean, if if you've been to a doctor somewhere, highly likely that information is stored in the cloud somewhere. You know, uh, your information on your driver's license that's stored somewhere. So we're not saying obviously our much of our information is already digitized. But to put sort of our fundamental, um, you know, I, I, the ability to identify ourselves sort of in, in, a, in a single place. Um, and, and, there, and then also in conjunction with that, there's, there's talk of digital currencies. I'm not talking cryptocurrencies. I'm talking central bank digital currencies. When you have a digital ID uh, paired with, a, you know, a, a digital currency, that is just asking for abuse. And again, Look what we saw these, you know, these last couple of years. I mean, theoretically, probably some of these these people who had their account shut down probably could have worked that out through the court system over months or years. But I don't want to give the government, you know, I don't have two years to waste. If they can, they can turn that switch off in two in two seconds, and I don't want to have to fight uh, for two years to get that switch turned back on. So I think that. Um, you know, what they're proposing with this digital idea is designed to do just, just that. With respect to crypto, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot of utility to, to what's going on with, with, crypt, with crypto and blockchain technologies. Um, I am not, um, you know, I, I'm not a, uh, you know, an Uber crypto guy or anything like that. But there's certainly uh, there's certainly applications to that technology and and uh, particularly for privacy and commerce that I think are are, are worthwhile. Okay. Yeah, that's. I mean, obviously, that's a huge topic. <laughs> yeah, I could go into that for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, well, maybe let's switch gears on a uh, you know, just a classic uh, politician interview. Uh, why don't we hit housing? You mentioned housing, on, and uh, Lucas here just bought a house actually. Um, just finally got into this crazy Ontario market and um, it is just sound, you know, it's something that's like unattainable for a guy of his age. My age was a little easier and I wish I was born 10 years ago or 10 years before I was. But um, yeah, you, you mentioned foreign investment and stuff like that in Ontario. Um, are there any other uh, changes that can be made, especially in Ontario and in some afford unaffordable cities like Toronto? Um, to kind of curb the runaway house prices or is that really even an issue? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it absolutely is an issue. It's a huge issue. Um, we strongly believe that foreign, foreign investment is a, uh, is a major cause 
Um, it's not the only cause, but it certainly is a major cause. And we would not only not only ban that, but un, unwind that as well. So, you know, for the person that owns 40 condos in Toronto and, and they, you know, they don't live or work here, um, we need to start unwinding those portfolios and get those units back in the market. Um, I'm not worried about, you know, the guy from Wisconsin that owns a cottage in Northern Ontario. That's not the, you know, the target here, but there is a lot of foreign purchasing. There's a lot of money laundering. Um, another major driver that nobody wants to talk about is actually immigration and the high levels of immigration into this province uh, certainly play into that as well. The nice thing about immigration is that it's actually a, a joint uh, sort of jurisdiction constitutionally between province and feds. So you'll note that a, a province like Quebec has a lot of authority over, over their provincial immigration. So we would seek to have that same uh, 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 you know, autonomy as well, provincially. So that's certainly something that separates us from uh, pretty much every party. No party, uh, federally or provincially, is 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 actively you know looking to lower immigration levels. So, and again, that's nothing against immigrants. Um, you know, God bless the you know God bless them, and I would want to come here too if I were them. But again, we have to make sure that we're bringing in quantities that don't strain our our you know our our, our structures here in Canada. Right. Right. Well, you do. You also do need immigration. Like I see what you're saying, and I agree. It is a major driver of housing prices. But also, we kind of do need immigration because of declining birth rates, just to keep uh, keep the workforce going and whatnot. Um, like, how do we balance that uh, that that need right there too? Because I, I'm not sure if it's a, an issue you can solve right off the bat. Well, I mean, if if all we're talking about, I mean, the the very first thing I would say is is that that is the problem you need to target. So for me, I would rather focus on you know increasing increasing birth rates here in Canada. Yeah. Um, of course, there's always going to be immigration coming into Canada, um, and you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what we're talking about is a policy that's designed to grow our population and significantly grow it uh, through immigration only. Um, if this was just replacement, you know, we wouldn't be growing our population by you know hundreds of thousands each year. So. Um, I think there, you know, there is a place for immigration, not not for the workforce per se, not not to re, not for replacement, but f to bring highly skilled people here that can make our country better. Uh, if we can't get our acts together to, you know, have enough kids to keep our economy going, that's a that's a deeper problem that needs to be addressed. So, you know, I, and part of that is a cost of living issue. So, you know, our government would incentivize people to. Um, uh, to incentivize people to, you know, be able to, you know, settle down and have, you know, make families and have kids. So that's something that, you know, frankly, uh, if your country can't do that, then it's, it's, it, that's the symptom of a sickness. So we need to make sure that our country is thriving enough to, to do that. Yeah, man, that's a big, that's a big goal. That's, <laughs> I mean, probably something you'll be, you'll be working over a couple of terms if you, uh, you know, became a leader. <laughs> um, yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, obviously curbing housing prices is huge. Well, and just making it affordable for people to to live and plan in Ontario um, as somebody who's going to be moving to Alberta um, <laughs> shortly after the election. Um, well, you know, now is probably a good time to cash out uh, in Ontario. Uh, yeah, just just sold a house, so it feels good. Um but yeah, well, I mean, you know what? Your money, your money will go further in Alberta than it does here. So maybe now. Yeah, the time right now it does. But uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't go too far with like the price of gas and everything. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what about what about that? What about inflation? And and I mean, obviously, a lot of that has to do with federal policy and and the disasters that we have going on in that you know realm. But um, what can be done from um, from the provincial end on that. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, you know, I mentioned some things that that can be dealt with at the provincial level for housing. There's no question that the cheap money uh, from the Bank of Canada is also fueling the uh, housing bubble that we have. That's that's certainly uh, an issue. Um, and there's also, you know, there are some red, there's obviously red tape things that, that can be adjusted as well. But for people who think that this is only a supply issue, they're sorely mistaken. And uh, there was a great uh, little graphic that was tweeted out or something, uh, I think it was tweeted out by uh, Douglas Porter, who's the chief economist at BMO. 
and uh, he showed housing supply in the G9, and it's all roughly the same. I mean, you know, give or take a little bit, but you look at the graph, it's all the same. We're not, we're not at the bottom end of that. We're kind of in the middle or the lower middle and everybody is similar. So the idea that this is a supply issue uh, uh, only is, is, is basically preposterous. And, and he makes, he makes that point increasing supply. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing, but the, you know, the, the it's the demand side that we need to curb. And uh, you know, I've mentioned some things uh, to do that. Um, yeah, so with respect to inflation, you're right. It's a major, major issue. And, um, you know, I think that, um, I think that, at, uh, you know, at the provincial, it, you know, and here's the other thing too. Um, there's no question that, there's no question that the monetary policy, you know, undertaken by, undertaken by the Bank of Canada and government spending has played a part in this. But um, honestly, a lot of this is supply chain disruption. And that had nothing to do with either of those policies. It had everything to do with the COVID policies that all the governments that we're, you know, we're dealing with. So, you know, our province is dead set against, you know, th that kind of supply chain destruction. We also want to bring more manufacturing back to Ontario. So I think give us, you know, give us a few years and we could actually make a big dent in, in the inflation. Um, you know, the price of gas right now, that's a combination of a lot of things. But it's not a combination of, you know, uh, uh, government spending. It's a combination, it, you know, it's a product of government ineptitude. Obviously, the war in Europe is, is impacting this or, you know, in Eastern Europe, there isn't impacting this. But it has nothing to do with, you know, uh, you know, government spending. It has to do with, you know, lousy policy choices, tons of useless taxes uh, and failure to set up our uh, energy infrastructure in here like they should have done, you know, 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously out uh, door to door, or like campaigning and whatnot. I'm, I'm sure you're across the province talking to many different Ontarians. Um, what are what are some of the concerns you're hearing from them? And also, I guess maybe just to add on to that, you know, you mentioned it off the top that you're a Christian, and obviously this is a Christian show as well. Are you hearing from from religious people broadly and also Christians about uh, issues that they feel? For example, like if they feel persecuted, or they feel like they can't practice their religion freely. Obviously, uh, this has been an issue throughout the pandemic and whatnot. Um, I know it's like Sam Ostroff, one of our recent guests, he has a like religious freedoms uh, bill on the table or he did prior to the election. But that was something he was uh, he was trying to champion as well. Um, is that something the Ontario Party is looking to uh, to improve upon, to improve religious freedom for Ontarians? Yeah, so we want to. Um we want to basically, uh, you know, amend the human right, provincial human rights legislation to include kind of like creed and conscience in the protections, because right now the protection is limited um, to kind of, you know, more strict, strict, provable religious convictions, as opposed to, you know, things that derive <laughs> from religious faith, but um, are not necessarily the tenet of a specific church, right? So we had a lot of people who... Um, you know, didn't want to take a particular medical procedure. It's not, it wasn't necessarily the specific tenant of their faith, but they just felt, you know, through an enlightened conscience that this was not the right thing for them. So we want to make sure that the protect, we, we don't want people generally to be forced to do things that they really don't want to do. Um, and, and that's an issue that we're seeing more and more with, you know, political correctness, and then also through COVID, all, all manner of different things. So these are things that we definitely do uh, want to address and, uh, and we will address them. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's obviously been a thing um, with, with the vaccine the lockdowns and all that. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we could speak a little bit further to, to that. I mean, obviously you don't agree with some of the, or all of the lockdown and, and uh, you know, forced vaccination or vaccine mandate um, um, measures that have been taken in Ontario, especially. Um yeah, what what kind of policies are are necessary to make sure that that doesn't you know occur in you know in the next wave of this thing or um, you know the next crisis that we reach? Yeah, I mean, I I almost think the only like the only thing really I think that would stop that would be um, you know mobilizing public opinion against them. I think a lot of people are, would be irritated if a you know a, a widespread lockdown was was initiated again. Most people uh, don't even think we're going to see them again. Um, or, you know, the, you know, more than half don't think that. So, you know, 
I think that mobilizing public opinion, obviously electing a party or a group of people that are uh, against that kind of overreach is, is important. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there is a guarantee. I mean, we've seen, um, we've seen the, the parties basically, all the government, many governments basically threw out their pandemic management practices, uh, you know, uh, prior to COVID and, 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 you know, basically tried brand new things. So it's tough to know what would prevent this in the future, other than, you know, having leaders in power that, that don't believe in this type of thing. Which is, uh, yeah, something that we need, I suppose. Eh? Um, yeah, I was. I, sorry, you got something? Oh, I was just going to jump on to. I was going to switch to critical race theory. But yeah, I was. Yeah, well, I was going to do the same thing with okay. education because we're seeing like we're seeing education under attack too. And um, yeah, maybe you can uh, yeah, run totally. into the critical race theory a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, this is a this is a um, not just an Ontario problem, but a problem across the nation and across uh, the Western world, really. Um, it's it's I mean it's fully infiltrated into many different education systems across North America, and and the world as well. Uh, it's a big problem. It's very destabilizing for for our culture, and um, yeah, and it's something to to certainly be aware of. And I don't see it uh, slowing down anytime soon. There was recently just this last session of the legislature leading up to the election. There was a bill that uh, Jordan Peterson was really raising the alarm about as well. Which sought to uh, to implement more critical race theory than uh, within the education system. Um, is that something the Ontario Party is concerned about? Um, do you have any plans to counter that? I know uh, Rick Nichols had voted for that, and then he uh, repented of his ways, for lack of a better phrase. Um, where does the Ontario Party stand on on critical race theory? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned Jordan Peterson because on the podcast that he was talking about uh, that bill they actually brought up the policy that our party has. And our policy is a very strong, uh, our party has a strong policy against that and indoctrination generally. So we do target the, you know, the teaching of critical race theory and we would, we would, we would ban it. But we also target uh, other subject, you know, indoctrination of subjective, you know, sexual values and ideas like gender theory and also sort of um, partisan political, uh, you know, sort of campaigning. Um, in the classroom. So we don't want our kids to be indoctrinated uh, with these kinds of ideas. And we certainly wouldn't allow it to happen. We also, beyond that, we actually have a phenomenal education plan um, because we want, to, um, we, we, we want to bring in a voucher system that would actually give parents control over where the money goes for their kid. So if they want to use it to homeschool or if they want to use it to go to a Christian school or a private school, they would be able to do that. Uh, under an, uh, our policy. So we have a great policy with uh, primary education and uh, people should check that out on our website. Is that just for primary education or how far up does that extend? So when I say primary, I mean not college and university. So K, so K to 12. So we would, uh, the, the, we spend about 12,500 as taxpayers per child on uh, for schooling. So we would give parents, you know, let's say two thirds of that or something like that. Uh, to, to, to go to a place of their choice. So it could be, you know, for homeschooling, Christian school, private school, uh, or maybe even a charter school. We want to make sure we open up, uh, you know, competition in the education sphere. And, uh, you know, frankly, that's something that your audience, I think, would love given, um, you know, I, uh, my kids are actually homeschooled now, but we used to have them at a local Christian school that, uh, you know, uh, is non-denominational, but, but was, you know, had, has strong Dutch roots to it. So, and there's a lot of Dutch people that go there. So, um, you know, it, it's, you know, the, 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 the education thing is something that um, is critical to our children. And we want to make sure parents have the choice about, you know, what kind of things are taught to their kids. I mean, it's very, it's a very important issue. And do you think that would change the face of the way we look at on education in Ontario? Because I mean, it seems to be culturally, it seems to be a given that your kids go to public school unless you're part of a, um, I mean, there are large groups that send to Catholic schools or, or Christian schools, private schools. Um, but would that would that change the way people look at that? Or, or would there be a, a larger group who are able to, you know, make the move that they really want to make in that, you know, the choice for their kid? Yeah, I think it would change things a lot. I think it would, you know, get the conversation going. Um, the, um, the, you know, uh, the, the traditional kind of, you know, people that, that go to private schools or Christian schools, whatever, has really grown in the last five, six, seven years. 
Uh, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, age and appropriate sex education and some of this other stuff that's going on. So I really do think there's an appetite for it. And, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, this kind of thing is needed. I mean, we, we can always do things better. And one of the things that irritates me in Canada is a, an insistence by our political class that we must, you know, kind of do things the same, you know, like, you know, we can't change healthcare. All we can do is pour more money into it. You know, we can't, you know, we can't change education. All it needs is more funding. We absolutely must change some of these things because, um, you know, they're not, they're not performing. So we, we have to change them and we have to look at new, uh, new things. Yeah. That definitely like puts some pressure on there anyway. Um, yeah, well, we want to respect your time a little bit here. Um, we should wrap up shortly, but I just want to ask about, um, just some, like, what are some of the things that people should be doing? Obviously like you're out probably door knocking and, and doing some stuff on the ground. And I mean, you have probably lots of people campaigning all over the, the province for you. Um, but in terms of um, things that people should be involved in, like what are some of the issues that that people can really make a difference as as Christians? Um, things that we should be getting out and doing to yeah to make a difference before the election or even in just in general. Sure. So I think Christians should be involved in politics and and uh, as much as possible. Um, you know, and I think the way to do that is to support a local candidate that you know, that you can get behind in terms of their values, in terms of, uh, you know, what they're up to. Um, you know, in, in, in our particular case, we have Ontario party candidates in most ridings in the province. Um, I would encourage people to, you know, reach out to them. You can go to our website, volunteer for them um, and get involved. It's a great way to make, meet new friends. It's a great way to, uh, you know, get out in the community. And um, it's a great way to, to have your voice heard. Um, you know, we're, the reason we're at where we're at in Canada right now is because not, you know, not enough good people have, have, you know, there's been too many good people who have done nothing basically in this country. And of course, there's a lot of good people doing many things, but uh, it's time to stand up and take our country back. Okay. Mm-hmm. I got one more question for you before we, uh, before we let you wrap it up maybe, but uh, I guess if you were to, and you probably encountering this all the time, but if you were to make the pitch to an undecided voter, I mean, obviously, they would probably typically be on the right side of the spectrum, but someone who is disgruntled and frustrated with Doug Ford and the PCs over the last uh, four years, but also realizes that, you know, politics is a it's a tough game. You, you have to make tough decisions. Um, you have to, you know, sometimes bend on your principles or compromise to get things done. Uh, they made mistakes, but they're and they're not perfect. But at the end of the day, you still have the liberals and the NDP in the wings. And you certainly want to avoid a return of uh, the, those those either of those Dr. parties. Evil? Yeah, Del Duca. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He does look a little Doctor Evilish. <laughs> um, anyways, but to, but to that kind of voter, um, what's the what's the pitch that that Derek Sloan and the Ontario Party are making? Yeah. So w- what I would say is, do you want anything to change in this province, or do you want it to stay the same? If you if you don't want anything to change, definitely don't vote for us. But if you think that things could be better and that things could be done differently, you should vote for the Ontario party because the other options out there are all different strokes of the same brush. And they're the reason why we are where we are. They're to blame for the problems that we're facing right now. And you can't expect the people that have brought us here to get us out of this jam. So for people that want something new, that don't want the, um, you know, the baggage that comes with the mainstream parties, the cronyism and the, you know, in some cases, corruption, they need to look at something new. And I'd also like to point out, I forgot to mention this earlier, our party is a party of strict free votes. So as I said, the bulk of mainstream parties always, you know, force their members of parliament or, or MLAs to vote along party lines. We, we don't have a whip in our party. We're not going to be doing that. We're going to have true free votes, which is the way that Parliament was designed so that you can actually represent your constituents. And our party is not going to be doing any of that, you know, kind of, um, you know, wheeling and dealing where only the leader and their unelected, you know, consultants make the moves. We want this to be, you know, true democracy, true parliament, uh, a true parliamentary system. And that's what our party stands for. Well, yeah, that's a big that's a big change for what for what we're used to. <laughs> we're used to seeing uh, the big yeah one vote going one way and one going the other way, and that's pretty much all that matters. So, exactly, wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, any last words you want to leave uh, with the listeners with? Or 
Listen, I appreciate you you having me on right now. I you know I firmly believe that the the only way to recover, you know, the true destiny that uh, that is intended for Canada is to is to recognize the um, you know the Christian roots of this country, the Christian values. It doesn't mean that you know everybody will be Christian or go to church or anything like that. But we can't you know revitalize our institutions without remembering where we came from, and that's a critical. Uh, part in this. And that's why I'm, you know, proud to be a Canadian, but also proud to be a Christian. And I think that every, uh, you know, every Christian and every person with, you know, uh, uh, faith based morals in this country should stand up and be counted. Um, it doesn't mean, of course, that we can't, you know, live with people who are not that way. Of course, we can. But we certainly need to revitalize that element of our history. And I'm proud to, you know, do my part to to help in that. Yeah, that's about as good as uh, we could wrap that up on the uh, reformed real talk. So that's good. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you for your time. And uh, yeah, we'll catch all you listeners next time. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. God bless. Yep. You too. You too. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Real Talk. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch the show. If you want to send us your feedback, and we'd love to hear it, please email us at reformedrealtalk at gmail.com. If you want to find us online or social media, we've got a lot of great content there. Just search Reformed Real Talk and we should come right up. This show is created and produced by myself, Lucas Holtfluer, and Tyler Vanderwood. And our wonderful podcast manager who does all the editing is Mariah Tamiga. So we're really thankful for her contribution to the show as well. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.